So we, are, we, are, we, we wait a couple of minutes for, for uh, the all attendees to enter the room. So it has not started yet, right? And we, start, we started the broadcasting, so people okay. are joining. Okay. You can see that the, the numbers are slowly going up. Okay. Yes. Um, I just found out, <clears throat> yeah, that, um, no, it's okay. Share again. Share. No, let's see. Okay. Yeah. You can see my pointer, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think if I, if I share, if I change to laser pointer, I have problems with uh, moving the slides. So I think I'll stay. Let's stay with the arrow. No worries, that's perfect. Yeah. I think we can we can. I think start. I think we're going to start. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for for attending in, in this this large number to the uh, to the seminar to the series on ecology and evolution in Montpellier. And uh, so, yeah, just a few reminders uh, about the about the. the, the so policy and etiquette in the during the, the seminar, you can ask your questions in the um, in the question and answer uh, toggle that you have on the bottom of your screen. Better than doing it in the in the chat. So please go to the question and answers, and then uh, you can always if there are many questions, you can always vote for one of them to be um, uh, to be asked if you if you prefer. And um, if you ask a question, then I think it's always nicer. If you then can ask uh, it aloud at the end of the of the presentation, so that you can we can always open your microphone and ask. And um, so is that. So the, the most important thing is that is please don't write in the chat, write in the question and answers. And then with this, I leave to Jean Tonavel, who is uh, who is the, the inviter of uh, Florian Schistel, and uh, so to do the presentation and uh, start the seminar. So Jean. So hi everyone, thanks a lot for attending today. So it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Florian Schissel today. So Florian did his PhD in Vienna and after a postdoc in Australia, uh, he occupied different position in Zurich where he is now an associate professor at the University of Zurich. So Florian is a specialist of uh, plant ecology and evolution, and in particular, he did lots of work uh, on uh, plant pollinator interaction by studying uh, it uh, through an evolutionary perspective, um, in particular by using experimental evolution in plants. So before I give the floor to Florian, I just wanted to mention that we're going to have a, a discussion session with Florian at half past one after the talk. So if you're interested in joining, please send me an email and I will uh, forward a link. Um, so with that, thanks a lot, Florian, for accepting to give the talk today. And uh, we are listening to you now. Thanks, John, uh, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to all of you for picking my talk. I, I understand I, I was picked among many different other options. So uh, I'm, it's a great pleasure for me to, to be here, and um, yeah, especially you don't have to travel, so I, you can do this on, in an online mode. It's very convenient, I think. So the topic of my talk is divergent evolution driven by biotic interactions um, that plants are engaged in. And uh, the first slide here is a sort of an, an emotional entry into this topic by showing just some very beautiful flowers. And these are flowers of Australian orchids. I, I did my postdoc in Australia, like Sean said, and um, I had the opportunity to, to marvel at these plants. Um, and what we really uh, admire about orchids is their, uh, their endless diversity in floral form that they display. And uh, you see here some examples from terrestrial orchids and they actually are representatives of a relatively closely related clade of plants. Um, so if you look at their vegetative uh, characters, for example, leaves, it's, it's actually very hard to discriminate them. They are so similar. They have not diverged in these characters, but they have evolved these uh, amazingly different flowers. And of course, this is um, a sort of um, a smoking gun, I would say, for the assumption that those plants have adapted to different pollinators. 
and use different pollination strategies, different pollinators, and by, by means of that, have evolved these uh, totally different flowers. And this idea, the concept of this idea that, that actually um, adaptation to different, different pollinators can bring about diversification in plant goes back to uh, Vern Grant. He was an American um, scientist who studied this in detail and uh, he noticed that often speciation in plants is associated with differences in flower traits. And uh, he sort of um, conceptualized the idea that, um, that the pollinators can, can lead to reproductive isolation by specifically uh, visiting only different kinds of flowers. Um, and this concept uh, is, was called by him and is called still now floral isolation. And it, uh, it, it bases on the assumption that um, by uh, visiting um, flowers specifically, pollinators secondarily um, uh, establish a mean of reproductive isolation between plant species. And um, here are just some fairly well studied examples of this phenomenon. Um, for example, the genus Mimulus here has uh, bee pollinated and bird pollinated uh, species. Um, the genus Petunia has bee pollinated and, and moth pollinated um, species. And this is the genus Ophrys uh, that I will talk about uh, a little bit later. Here we have floral isolation on a species basis. So we have species specific pollinators that again lead to very strong reproductive isolation between uh, two plant species. And um, many uh, meta studies, meta analyses uh, that looked at the, the relative importance of different reproductive barriers in plants have shown that floral isolation, because it acts so early in the sequence of, of uh, different reproductive isolation mechanisms, is often very important um, and a, a primary barrier to, to speciation. So we know that, we know pollinators are very important for that, um, but we often don't know whether they are really the primary force for, for speciation. Now, um, how can we, um, can we see this, uh, this process happening? What's the reason for plants to adapt to different pollinators? This is of course a different question. And um, there are basically two scenarios that we think how, how this can work. Um, the first one is an essentially allopatric um, scenario with divergent selection being in place and driving then the adaptation to different pollinators. And this, um, this scenario rests on the assumption that um, pollinators are not evenly distributed in the landscape, but they form clusters of different abundances. And this uh, Vern Grant called this, this the, the pollinator climate. So climate is an abiotic factor that is um, heterogeneous in the landscape, but also pollinators and biotic factor is also heterogeneous. And here, um, this map shows the dis distribution of different long tongue flies in the Cape region of South Africa as an example of this, this pollinator mosaic. And as plants grow in different region regions, they are um, selected to use the most abundant, the most efficient, pollinator um, and thereby adapt to this pollinator, leading to diversification here is just a Gymnadenia flower is just a symbol um, to the adaptation, um, diversification by the adaptation to different pollinators. So this example is just a selection for spur lengths, so adaptation to short, short proboscis and long proboscis pollinators. But this can happen, of course, in, in, in any characters, it could also be true for color or for scent or different floral traits. And the second scenario is, an, uh, is a sympatric scenario, scenario of sympatric speciation. And here we need to assume disruptive selection. So disruptive selection is when a population splits into two um, peaks. And disruptive selection here rests on the assumption that we have um, a phenomenon called negative density dependent selection. That means, um, one floral type becomes really common and thereby overuses um, its resource of pollinators. And, and uh, because of that, the, the reproductive success of this floral morph decreases. So the more common a plant with a given flower type becomes, the lower its uh, reproductive success. So a negative density dependent uh, association between fitness and abundance. 
And um, in this situation where um, a given species is very common, um, it is strongly pollinator limited. And then um, a new form, sort of a, a mutation that leads to attraction of a new pollinator can be very uh, successful initially because it uses a new pollinator niche um, and becomes established by, by being so successful in, in using a new niche. So this is then uh, diversification in, in sympatry um, by disruptive selection. And here we need a very strong reproductive barrier, so very strong floral isolation, because the two forms are still in sympatry and can, um, can, can exchange uh, genes. So to, to reduce this gene flow between the two floral forms, we need very strong floral isolation. Okay, now, so far so good. We know these scenarios, they work. But uh, I've said already, um, pollinator adaptation is, of course, not the only um, factor that leads to diversification. And um, if we look at the broader picture, if you use uh, phylogenies and reconstruct um, mechanisms of speciation, we often see that pollinator switches are linked to switches in abiotic factors. For example, um, plants that grow on different soil types often use different pollinators, or plants that uh, live in different climatic niches also use different pollinators. So there is a strong inherent link between biotic and abiotic factors in, um, in plant speciation. And this, of course, means that often we do not really know what was the primary initial uh, force that, that led to the diversification of these of this plant clades. Could be that first the plants actually adapted to different soil types and secondarily because different pollinators are more abundant on different soil types, they adapted to different pollinators. Or the adaptation to pollinators came first and then secondarily plants moved to different uh, soil types to avoid competition, for example. So this is something that we, we really don't know up to now. Um, and it is something that uh, we were interested in and we try to address this experimentally in our research. Another factor that uh, is very important um, for plants is herbivory. Herbivory is um, an antagonistic interaction that uh, many plants are engaged with. So almost all plant species have their herbivores. Um, Herbivore can also impact on, on plant reproduction um, through direct or indirect effects. For example, direct effects are if um, herbivores feed on the plants and then the plants have less resources um, that can be invested in seed production because the biomass is lost to the herbivores. So this is an, a direct effect, but there are also indirect effects and indirect effects are when herbivory um, indirectly impact pollination. And this can happen if um, plants, um, after herbivores attack, plants often upregulate their defenses, so they become better defended. For example, they produce more toxic compounds. Um, and these defense compounds also travel into the rewards. For example, the nectar then becomes more toxic. This has been shown in several um, plant species. And this higher to toxicity impacts the behavior of the pollinators um, and thereby selection by pollinators is changed and then floral evolution can also be impacted by, by herbivory through that route. But um, again, we know very little uh, about the impact of herbivory on, on floral evolution and then plant speciation. Um, essentially, we have some, some meta analysis and, and a few uh, mechanistic studies, but uh, overall, we, this is very little, um, little investigated. Okay, so we come to the specific topics of my talk now. The overall topic is divergence driven by biotic interactions. And essentially, I'd like to give you two examples from my past research, how um, I have addressed this. Um, first, I'd like to talk about uh, some field work that um, I've done with orchids, some example actually from, from France. Um, we've done some, some field work. Um, and this is, this is essentially correlative evidence for the importance of pollinator adaptation in divergence. Because with orchids, you cannot really do um, proper experimental work. 
you cannot grow orchids in the greenhouse because they have very small seeds. They need mycorrhiza to germinate. They, they take several years to get into flower. They have a typical perennial lifestyle. So they have all sorts of um, problems associated with them. But um, they show very strong adaptations. So they, they serve as very illustrative examples of uh, pollinator adaptation and they're very specific pollination systems. So they are a very fascinating study system, but they have certain limitations. And um, some years ago, I, um, I thought about how to overcome these uh, limitations by, by using a different um, study system, a different experimental system. And I came to work with Brassica, with the Brassica Rapa system, which is a perfect system for, for experimental work in the greenhouse because the plants are very, very, um, have very short generation time. You can do experimental evolution. They're very easy to grow. They have a generalized pollination system and so on. So they have several advantages to address these questions experimentally. And in the second part of my talk, I will, I will give you some examples of these experiments that we have done, which I think um, are very interesting in their outcome. Now, first of all, uh, I'd like to say a few words about the orchid system. And the orchid system, the genus Ophrys, that um, we have been studying in the past, is an example of a floral mimicry. Um, and floral mimicry is a phenomenon that's um, relatively common in plants. Uh, of course, we know mimicry better from, for example, butterflies, protective mimicry. Um, so non-toxic butterflies mimic toxic butterflies and thereby enjoy protection. Floral mimicry is different. It's not uh, protective mimicry. It's called aggressive mimicry because it leads to the attraction of an, of an, an organism. So the, the dupe essentially is, um, is an animal that is attracted to the mimic. And the, the floral mimic, uh, mimicry systems, the, the mimic usually mimics um, an item of interest for the pollinator. So this, this item could be a female, for example, to attract males. The item could be a food, food source, nectar source here to attract a nectar seeking animal. It could be an oviposition site, for example, in this uh, dung mimic here or in this carrion mimic. The, the pollinators are insects that, that normally lay their eggs into dung or in carcass and thereby uh, get attracted to these flowers and pollinate them. So it's always a kind of um, an, an item of strong interest and pollination is very specific typically and also quite effective. So the attraction is very strong because there's often stiff competition for these items of interest. Um, and the insect really must respond very quickly to them. And this is something the plants um, abuse. So they, they sort of um, they hack in themselves into the communication channel that the, the pollinators normally have is, is the item of interest. And I just would like to uh, make a little commercial here um, for this book that I've been, um, I've written with my colleague, Steve Johnson. It's published in, in Oxford University Press. If you're interested in floral mimicry, you may want to buy this book. It's uh, I think the only monograph on the topic and it, it summarizes the, the state of the art in, in this phenomenon. Okay, now the study system, this is the, Actually, I've worked many years on orchids. This is, this is my last project on orchids so far that I've done. And we've published this uh, study in 2017. Since then, I have not worked on orchids anymore, but I'm, I'm now thinking of getting into orchids again. So I've not totally given up on orchids. They're just uh, too fascinating. And uh, this is a system we've been studying very close to you in the Avaron, so uh, north of Montpellier. We've done several years of field work. Um, I and my student, Nicolas Verrecken, who is now a professor in, in Brussels. Um, and we studied this uh, monophyletic clade of orchids, um, which consists of three species. So it's very nicely small. You, get, uh, you can keep the overview. And we have one very uh, widely distributed species here, Ophrys insectifera, uh, which is uh, distributed from Northern Spain up to the South of Sweden. So it's really um, widely distributed, very common in Switzerland as well. And then we have two local endemics and they make the system interesting because you can uh, study speciation here. This is Ophrys aimonini, which is found in the Avaron, uh, north of Montpellier. And then we have Ophrys subinsectifera, which is found in the Pyrene Pyrenees in the north of Spain. And um, all these three species have different pollinators. We have a digger wasp here in Ophrys insectifera. 
We have a solitary B in Office I Monini, and we have a saw fly here in Office Subinsectifora. So this is this is a very peculiar system, very unusual. Saw flies are normally not pollinators of Office. Only this species um, uses um, uses this pollinator. Okay. Um, so we see here the distribution of these three species. And uh, normally at this point, I uh, sort of say how beautiful the Avaron is and uh, everybody should go to Sasson France because it's so, it's so nice. But of course, I don't need to talk to you about this. You probably know the region. You know the local specialities, the, the crops of ducks, um, which is interesting. Uh, Roquefort cheese, of course, is uh, very strong in olfactory signals. and. Um, because I'm also interested in floral scent. Um, I'm a bit of a chemical ecologist as well. Um, I, I like the smell. This is another local endemic here, Ophris Averonensis, which is a very, very beautiful um, Ophris. So it is a very spectacular region. And I, I really, really thoroughly enjoyed the, the field work in this region. It was a wonderful uh, time that we we're having there. Now, this is Dani, Dani Gavasi, who did uh, his PhD on this. Um, on the system. And first of all, we studied floral isolation in these plants. And now one can do this uh, very nicely in orchids because orchids have um, a big advantage for this. They, they pack their pollen into, into discrete, discrete structures, so-called pollinia. So pollinia are packages of pollen and they are given to the pollinator as a discrete structure. So, so one pollinator can essentially take all the pollen of one flower in one visit. And we have uh, stained this uh, pollinia here. Can, you can see it with red and green color. And then you can actually follow the flow of this pollen um, in, in real time in, the, in nature. And we have set up plots, mixed plots with the two species here with stained pollinia. And then we've checked, we checked every morning um, whether we found stained pollen in the, in the stigma. You can see here green, green um, grain of uh, pollen package and here red um, pollen. So this is an, this is an, an intraspecific transfer because red was the color of Insectifera and green was the color of Aemonini. But we could also see if there was a transfer between the species. If a, if a green pollen would have been landed on, on the stigma of uh, Insectifera, this would have been an, an interspecific, so between the species transfer. Now we've done this for three years um, and here you see the results already. We found only intraspecific transfers. We did not find very many, tra many transfers. Uh, pollination is not very common, so these species are strongly pollen limited in their reproductive success. But floral isolation is very strong among these species. We did not find a single transfer between the species in the field. So the first sort of um, prerequisite for pollinator-driven speciation is established. Role isolation is very strong between these sister species. Okay, and, and there is also no post-pollination isolation. So we did a lot of crossing experiments. If you manually cross the two species, they, they totally um, produce normal seeds. So there's no barrier, so genetic barrier between them. Um, so they're totally compatible with each other. And this is a very typical situation for, for orchids. Orchids often don't have post-pollination barriers and Ophrys, um, also orchids of the genus Ophrys especially, often have very strong floral isolation. So we've studied this in different systems as well. And we always found the same picture. Floral isolation is very strong among closely related Ophrys species. <clears throat> now, what are the traits that lead to specific att attraction of pollinators? Um, this is, in Ophrys, it's typically the scent. The floral scent is very important. So it's the scent is a mimicry of the bee mating system, a ma mating signal. So it, the scent mimics the sexual pheromone of the bees. And in, in this Aimonini system, we have done electrophysiological recordings. Here you have a pollinator male. So you can record from the antenna of the male and then see which scent compounds are actually smelled by the bee. Um, and we have done this and we have identified four compounds here two uh, so-called alkenes, these are unsaturated straight chain uh, hydrocarbons, and two, um, two um, wax esters, again, long chain um, hydrocarbons. 
and these were physiologically active in the in the male bees, and they were also significantly different uh, in the abundance in Ophrys insectifera and Ophrys aimonini. So this makes sense. So Ophrys aimonini uh, produces more of these compounds and thereby attracts a new pollinator. This is, was the hypothesis, and we have tested this hypothesis by applying this cocktail of four compounds on the flowers of insectifera. So we manipulated the flowers and then presented these manipulated flowers to the bees and, and uh, tried to observe that they would be attracted. And indeed, they were attracted here. You can see here, um, when you present to the bees the insectifera control flower, it's not attractive. Not, I mean, some bees do inspect it, but they never land on it. But if you manipulate the flowers with this cocktail of four compounds, then um, the flowers do become attractive. So there's a lot more approaches. And we also observed a few landings and uh, attempted copulations. You can see this here on the pictures. Here you see the flower of insectifera with a bee landing on it. And this is something you would normally never, never ever see. Only with this manipulation of the scent, the flowers become attractive to the bee. And then as a positive control, we have here the flower of Ophrys aimonini, which is still a lot more attractive, um, but obviously it has a fine-tuned um, scent bouquet that has evolved um, for many generations under the selection of the pollinator. So of course, it's, it's still doing a better job here. But um, the production of these compounds, um, uh, we, we think was the, 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 the initial trait to attract a new, the bee as a new pollinator in Ophrys aimonini. Okay, and then the last um, aspect that we have investigated was negative density dependent selection, sort of the prerequisite for, um, for disruptive selection leading to sympathetic speciation. So we would expect that the density of local populations are negatively associated with their pollination success. And this is something that we did find in Ophrys insectifera here. There was a negative, significantly negative association between relative fruit set and then the density, the local density of the plants in the sites. And um, for Ophrys aimoni, it was a similar trend, but it was not significant. But anyway, we, we need this, um, this assumption in those Ophrys insectifera because Ophrys insectifera is um, the idea that is the maternal species from which Ophrys aimonini has evolved by budding speciation. Okay, so we think that we have uh, we have shown a nice package of yeah, it's correlative evidence. Of course, it's no no real experimental proof of, of uh, pollinator mediated speciation, but it is very strong strong evidence that um, in this system, in this very specific pollination system. Pluralization is very strong and based on simple traits, so it's just a, a cocktail of four scent compounds. Um, and uh, the, the, the switch between pollinators can be sympatric because we have this negative density dependent selection um, that leads to pollinator switches. So we think that's the scenario for pollinator mediated speciation in this system. Okay, so we move away from the orchids now and um, dive into a new system, that's the Brassica system. I've already said I've started working with Brassica because it's uh, experimentally much more easy to, to work with. It's also nice because it has some, some obvious links to agricultural systems. Um, Brassica rapa is one of the parent species of oilseed rape, which is a very important crop species probably one, one of the most important crops grown in Switzerland. Brassicaceae are very well known for the defense system. They have the so-called glucosinolates compounds, um, the mustard oil bomb. Glucosinolates are a storage form of the defense compounds. And when the cells are disrupted, then the glucosinolates come in contact with the myrosinase enzyme and so-called isothiocyanates are produced. And you all know how isothionates uh, smell because you know the smell of uh, horseradish or wasabi or mustard. And the sharp sensation of these spices are derived from isothiocyanates. So what, what we like about this sharp sensation is originally a defense function of the brassicaceae uh, that produced these compounds. The pollination system in almost all brassicaceae is generalized. So they, they strongly differ from orchids. They have a an open pollination system, the, 
that the rewards are accessible to many insects. Um, yeah, you don't need specific uh, traits to, 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 to gather them. But this is nice for, for experimental studying of the systems. Uh, so we could enable them uh, well. And then um, the nice thing about Brassicaraba is that there are so-called fast cycling varieties available. So they have been specifically selected for short generation time. Um, there's a company called Wisconsin Fast Plant that was uh, founded by Paul Williams at the Wisconsin University. And, 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 and they specifically produce these, these uh, plants for, um, for use, for example, in, yeah, in education and research. Um, they're very nice for using in, in courses because you can really in one semester, you can, you can go through two or three generations. So you can nicely show segregation of traits. You can also buy uh, specific mutants and so on. So they're really a beautiful tool. You can also study interactions and herbivory with your students. Um, one generation from seed to seed is about uh, seven weeks or two months. So it's really very quick. They are outcrossing yourself incompatible, um, have a small genome size. We're also doing genomic studies now. So they're also nice for that. So they are a great system. And um, the pollinators um, and herbivores that we have been using, sorry, um, but those insects that you can also buy commercially. So we can buy bumblebees and they're used for tomato pollination and uh, hoverflies um, can also be purchased as a biological anti-herbivore anti agents. And then herbivores we breed ourselves. And this is the design of the experimental evolution studies um, that we've been doing. And um, either you just believe that it's a good design or you can follow me through the design quickly. We've started with a set of uh, full seed seed families, which we have spread through uh, three replicates. So each uh, treatment is usually done three times with different plant families. So 36 plants, each representing one family. And then the different treatments, for example, different pollinators. Um, so they, the treatments have the same families, but uh, replicates of different families. So we spread the control for genetic diversity and we spread this um, genetic diversity within the, the treatments that we do. And um, this is just a, a sketch of how this works here. Um, we set up the 36 plants, which are independent replicates. And then pollination is done. For example, hand pollination is a control or bumblebees and hoverflies are allowed in, into the cage. Here you see the cage and the insects um, visiting the, the flowers. And then from the seeds that are produced each generation, the next generation is grown. And the same procedure is repeated here pollinators, um, maybe herbivores also. And this is done until the end of the experiment. And at the end of the experiment, we grow the plant for two generations without any interactions to, first of all, to overcome maternal effects that may have accumulated, for example, with herbivory. And also inbreeding, because there's quite a bit of inbreeding going on. We have a bottleneck between each generation because not all plants get pollinated. And uh, there's quite a bit of inbreeding. So we cross the replicates at the end to overcome the inbreeding effects because we're not interested in, in inbreeding, we're interested in, in um, adaptive evolution driven by selection. And then at the end, we phenotype the plants uh, by measuring all those traits here, for all scent, for example, then uh, for all color here, this is UV reflection and absorption. Um, so brassica flowers, they, they uh, absorb UV and have this dark spot in the middle. Then um, morphological traits like flower size or hercogamy, the separation, spatial separation of the sexual organs, um, defense compounds, nectar, and so on. So this is all, it's a lot of work, of course. You can see Dani, he was, he was still happy in the, in the beginning. He was also, also happy in the end because his experiment was, was very successful. But it was also a lot of work. It's still a lot of work, of course these kind of um, experiments. So Dani, essentially, he studied the onset of, of, um, of divergent evolution by adaptation to different pollinators. So basically asking the question, only by adapting to different pollinators, do we see divergent evolution in these plants? And which traits um, evolve uh, in such short time? So which traits show rapid evolution? Um, and which traits diverge first? And he did this by using bumblebee pollination, hoverfly pollination, and hand pollination as a control during nine generations. Yeah. 
And then he also studied selection. This is just uh, very briefly showing that he found divergent selection, so significantly different selection on different traits, for example, on plant height here. You see here the, the average selection imposed by bumblebees in blue and the average selection by hoverflies in green. And then three scent compounds were also under significant divergent selection. So already the smoking gun that, okay, different pollinators do cause divergent selection. And this is the outcome here, um, the pattern of evolution, divergent evolution after nine plus two, that's 11 generations. And here we see uh, in green, the hoverfly pollinator plants, in blue, the bumblebee pollinator plants, and in black, the um, hand pollinator plants. And we see the, the, the group centroids for the three replicates. So the, the field uh, symbols are the three replicates. And you can see very nicely in these figures that the, the three replicates have always diverged in the same direction here. And this is a strong indication that this um, divergent evolution was driven by selection and not by drift. Because drift, by definition, is a random process. And we should have, if drift was important, we should have seen that the replicates all over the place, essentially, and not in the same direction. So this evolution in the same direction um, can be explained by evolution by selection, so adaptive evolution. Okay, then just a picture how these plants looked like after the end of the um, of the experiment. And I'm always showing this picture because I, I was so fascinated by this difference. I, I would have never expected the plants to be so different, especially in a trait like floral uh, plant height that uh, I would not have expected to evolve so strongly. Um, and please keep in mind that for these plants, the only difference was pollination. So the plants grew on the same soil, they had the same watering, the same fertilization, um, the same uh, climatic condition. There was no difference whatsoever. Only the pollinators were different. And I think this really shows that the power of um, pollinator-driven evolution, here we see just two um, uh, individual examples on how different they looked like. And then just some traits that uh, strongly evolved in different direction. This is plant height here. Um, yeah, the sequence from generation 1 to 11, you see that height decreased in hoverfly pollinated plants, most likely due to inbreeding. And then it, it increased the strongest in, in bumblebee <coughs> pollinated plants, <coughs> because bumblebees strongly select for plant height. They like uh, taller plants. Then floral scent <coughs> very strongly evolved. Two compounds here, I'm showing you phenylacetaldehyde and anisaldehyde, both strongly increased in the bee, again, in the bee pollinated uh, treatment. And this is nice because we know that bumblebees really like the floral scent. Floral scent is also an honest signal. So the amount of, for example, phenylacetaldehyde indicates the sugar in nectar, so the amount of sugar that the, the plants can produce. And then bees strongly um, um, uh, or quickly learn the honest signals and use these honest signals to decide which, which plant to visit. So it makes a lot of sense that especially bees select for, for these compounds and these compounds then quickly, very rapidly increase uh, to, an, to a very um, high degree. And we also know that hoverflies are not so interested in scent, they just uh, they don't care so much about scent. So here it makes sense that the scent does not increase. And then at the end, we also tested for pollinator preferences. So asking the question, was this evolutionary change adaptive? And did it lead to high attractiveness um, of those um, plants for the respective pollinators. And we addressed this by, by choice experiments, dual choice experiments, where we gave the pollinators a choice between bumblebee and hoverfly selected uh, plant. And then the result was that bumblebee strongly preferred the bumblebee selected plants at the end. So they had a strong preference for these plants. But this was not the case for hoverflies. So the traits that evolved on the bumblebee selection obviously were adaptive led to an increased attractiveness of the flowers, but this was not the case. In hoverflies, there was obviously no adaptive evolution in floral traits. The flowers became not more attractive for hoverflies. But um, there was something else happening in hoverfly pollinated plants, another kind of adaptive evolution, and this was an, an increase in selfing. And this is shown here. We have uh, two 
two characteristics here. Uh, first of all, self-compatibility. Self-compatibility was increased in all groups, actually. But spontaneous selfing was especially strongly increased in hoverfly plants. And the explanation here is that um, hoverflies are basically lousy pollinators. They, they, they transfer much less pollen than bumblebees during each visit. And also their behavior is much slower. They sit for a long time on the flowers. They don't move so much. So they're just much less efficient in their pollination than, than, than bumblebees. And, and plants, of course, if they have an, um, a low efficiency pollinator, are selected to self-pollinate. Self-pollination becomes a more effective strategy under this scenario. And this obviously happened here. Um, the plants uh, evolved from, from strictly outcrossing into mixed mating. So a mix between outcrossing and self-pollination. Okay, and um, before we finish, um, just a brief outlook in another experiment that uh, we have been doing. And this was uh, addressing the impact of herbivory. Because herbivory is so important and ubiquitous, um, we wanted to see whether leaf herbivory also has an impact on floral evolution. And this was the, the topic of Sergio who graduated uh, one and a half years ago, so relatively recently. And he, uh, in addition to bee pollination, he applied leaf herbivory. So he put uh, caterpillars on the leaves um, for, for a few days of, of some plants and then controlled plants had no herbivory. And then uh, he tried to study the effect of herbivory on floral evolution. Okay, and here is already the result. Um, this is Sergio's data here. You can see here the hand pollinated uh, plants and then hand pollination plus leaf herbivory. It's almost at the same um, place here, which says that herbivory, leaf herbivory alone does not really cause much floral evolution. So there are, there are very little direct effects here on floral evolution. However, leaf herbivory had a strong effect on the evolution that was caused by bees. Because if you see here the only bee pollinated plants, the blue dot, and then bee pollination plus herbivory was quite different, was strongly different. So those plants evolved in a quite different direction. So there was an interactive effect between herbivory and pollination in these plants. And this is also shown here in the, in the test of attractiveness. We did the same um, the attractiveness tests. In this, in this case, we used four different plants together, the four different um, uh, the, 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 the different um, treatment groups. And you see here that the only bumblebee plants were by far the most attractive ones. And plants with bumblebees and herbivory had a reduced attractiveness here, significantly reduced. That basically says that um, the plants, when they have herbivory, are not able to evolve to their full attractiveness for bees. So there's some compromise in the attractiveness that these plants um, um, have, to, have, to, have, to, have to face. And then the hand pollinated plants were clearly the less, the least attractive um, ones in this experiment. And again, um, we saw um, an increase for self pollination, in this case, strong increase in self compatibility and spontaneous selfing. So, and this was found in plants with herbivory and bee pollination. So, herbivory plus bee pollination, again, an interactive effect caused a strong increase in self pollination. And um, we, we think we know what the mechanisms behind this is because we measured the visitation time of bumblebees on the plants. And the finding here was that with herbivory, the bees spend less time on the, on the flowers. And again, the reason for this, we think we know it be because the, the, the plants with herbivory had a higher degree of glucosinolates in the nectar. So this is the effect that I've mentioned in the beginning that plants upregulate their defense and some of these defense compounds also travel in the nectar and then the nectar starts in this case it starts to, to smell like wasabi and uh, the bees probably don't like that that sharp sensation and then they spend less time on the flowers leading to increased pollen limitation of these plants and stronger selection for self-pollination. Okay, and this is this is um, this effect is not new. It's been shown before that herbivory can make flowers less attractive and then lead to increased pollen limitation. And we have shown here that this can rapidly lead to the evolution of increased self pollination. 
And then another effect here was in, um, decreased hercogamy. So hercogamy is the spatial separation of uh, sexual organs in the flower. So the, the stamen and uh, the stigma came closer to each other with herbivory. And this was interesting. This was not an interactive effect here, but it was an only effect of herbivory. So we saw this effect with both hand pollination and with bee pollination. So just herbivory can, can cause this effect. And um, so this is not driven by, by selection, but I, I, we think this is a pleiotropic effect of, um, of herbivory. So the, the, the physiological changes that the plants um, um, trigger when, when herbivory strikes probably leads to, to this re reduced hercogamy. And one possible um, hypothesis for, the, for how this happens is that uh, the, one of the important defense signaling compounds is jasmonate, the hormone jasmonate. And jasmonate is also important in flower development. So there is a kind of um, a possible link here that the jasmonate increased defense signaling can, can cause this change in flower development, leading to lower hercogamy. And of course, lower hercogamy enables um, higher self pollination. So this is an important prerequisite for more self pollination happening and biologically it makes sense right if, if if the plant is attacked by by herbivores it will um have a reduced survival and it makes sense to to engage more in self-pollination rather than waiting for pollinators to do cross-pollination so this is probably an adapt adaptive effect to more self-pollinate when you are attacked by herbivores okay um now we are already at the end and I'd just like to, to summarize here that uh, we have shown here experimentally, and this is a, a solid proof here that um, different pollinators can lead to, to rapid divergent evolution. Um, and this is a very rapid process. Uh, so in nine generations, so evolution can be very, very quick in these systems. Um, and I think we should say goodbye to the idea that the evolution is a very slow process. It can happen very quickly in, in this system. And then for our scent and mating system were the traits that evolved particularly rapidly in, in our experiments. And then um, for herbivory, it's uh, herbivory has strong interactive effects, which can, um, can strongly impact on, on floral evolution. Um, and particularly um, on increasing selfing in Brassica, this is a strong effect that we have uh, demonstrated. So maybe as a, as a the final take home message is that biotic factors alone are a very strong evolutionary force in the diversification of plants. And with that, uh, I'd like to end thanking my group members for their, of course, it's all their work, um, the important con uh, contributions by, by Dani Gavasi and Sergio, um, of course, also others um, like Penjiang Tzu, Anina Knauer, Roman Kellenberger, Franz Huber, and Alice. Alice was an important. Um, technical assistant in the, in the greenhouse. She helped with the phenotyping and the, the massive uh, number of plants that needed to be worked on. So it, she was a very important person in this um, research. And then of course the funding sources. Um, yeah, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to some questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Florian, for this very nice and interesting talk. Um, so we are going to um, start with a question. And uh, I would like to first give um, uh, the floor to um, PhD. So Candice, um, you can ask your questions, please. Can you? Okay. Um, so I have many questions, <laughs> maybe three. Uh, okay, so so perhaps you can just pick one so that everyone can okay. participate. So do all orchids mimic pollinator sexual pheromones via the vox, or just some orchids? I'm not an expert okay. of orchids, and I I work on on vox of plants, and I'm interested in the in that um, in that response. Yeah. So um, orchids can essentially do everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the probably orchids are the most uh, diversified uh, plant family in terms of pollination systems. Some orchids produce normal um, nectar as a reward. Some are nectarless. Um, they have so-called generalized food deception system. 
some uh, mimic food, some mimic um, dung, carcass, or sexual sexual signals. So you find almost anything in orchids. They are extremely different and diverse. Uh, everything is possible in this plant group. But um, I mean, volatiles are often important in specific, generally, volatiles are important in specific pollination systems. Whether they are deceptive or rewarding, it doesn't really matter so much. But volatiles are specific signals because they, they, they often uh, comprise a big chemical diversity, so different chemical compounds, which can encode a large uh, amount of different signals. That's, that's a simple explanation why, why scent is very important in specific pollination. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thanks a lot. So now uh, we have a question from uh, Xavier Vecmans. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for, for your very, very clear presentation. I really enjoy it uh, really a lot. Thank you. Uh, so uh, so just my, my, my question is just a curiosity. Is it, is it, so, so you mentioned that very often uh, uh, among related orchid species, you, you don't have uh, uh, much uh, post-zygotic uh, barriers. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering, uh, are, are there any explanation uh, produced uh, uh, about this? Because if you have very, very strong pre-zygotic isolation, you would think that over time you would have an accumulation of, mm -hmm. uh, of barriers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, also a hard one. I don't think there are any convincing explanations why this is the case. I mean, there are some ideas um, that relate to the so-called syngamion uh, idea. So syngamion is a, is a sort of a group of um, uh, organisms that occasionally share um, um, have gene flow among themselves. So evolve collectively, um, but can still stay morphologically distinct because of selection. This is of course a, a possible explanation that you have, um, occasionally you do have gene flow between the species, um, which keeps them connected um, in deep time, so to say. Still, you do have um, a separation and, and normally strong isolation between them, but that isolation could be temporally instable, so to say that at certain events, you do have some gene flow between species and then you, you do see a mixing of genomes. It's also um, often the case that closely related um, orchids, they often, often they have very, very little genetic differences between them. So traditional phylogenetic studies <clears throat> often were not able to find good resolution <clears throat> between orchid species. And there's, there was a big debate and still ongoing of what is really a good species in orchids, in close related orchids, especially in Ophrys. This is a big, uh, big discussion because the genetic differences are so low. And of course, you can explain this with, um, with recent speciation, recent diversification. But you can also explain it that occasionally you do have gene flow between um, between the species, but uh, I would say this is not resolved, and we, we don't really have a good answer. Uh, no. Okay, thanks. Uh, that may, makes sense. Of course, it would be interesting to to measure introgression uh, at, at the whole genome level just to to see mm -hmm. whether it would be really yeah. would be restricted to 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 the the traits involved in reproductive uh, in, in right. prezygotic virus. Thanks. Yeah. So, so now Mathilde Dufay, you can ask your question. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi Florian. No. Hi. Hi. Nice talk. Fred. Thank you very much. Um, so I have a couple of questions, but I will just uh, pick one for now. I was wondering, maybe you mentioned it, but I was wondering whether there was some pollen limitation in the population that evolved with the bumblebees in your Brassica rapa experiments? Mm -hmm. Well, what, does, did, did you measure some pollen limitation or, or not? Or do you know if there were some? Um, so we, we did not directly measure pollen limitation, <clears throat> but um, I mean, we, we, we kind of made sure that, um, that there's pollen limitation overall in the whole population. Because of course, if you don't have pollen limitation, you also don't have pollinated evolution. So the, 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 the preferences and the, the choice of the pollinators must lead um, to, to differences in, in fitness among the plants. Otherwise you have no pollinator driven evolution. So in other words, if, if a pollinator chooses um, a specific plant, 
this plant must produce more seeds than their, uh, their neighbors that are not chosen. Yeah, that was my point precisely yeah. because you yeah. could have no pollen limitation, but still evolution through the, the male fitness because true. Yeah. That, well, my, my question was, do you have any hints about the, the relative weight of evolution that occurred through female or male fitness? That asked a question about pollen limitation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the I think the trick of this experiment to I mean pollen limitation is very common in nature, but um, in such an experimental situation, it is important to sort of set uh, set pollen limitation at a stage that is um, comparable, of course, to a normal <clears throat> to a natural situation, um, but also not too strong. So it is sort of um, something that, um, that that makes sense in terms of uh, natural evolution, and you have to do it artificially because if you if you let too many bumblebees inside, then they will just pollinate everything, and, and nothing will happen. So what we did, we, we allowed only five bumblebees inside and we only allowed three visits per bumblebee. So that led to the, the fact that only about half of the plants got a visit in the experiment. So half of the plants always got no visit and they had no, no fitness at all and were sort of dropping out of this, uh, of this generation. But uh, coming back to your original question, um, we don't really know, I mean, for sure, both male and female fitness was important, but um, we have not specifically um, differentiated between the two, so we don't really know um, what was more important. Yeah. Does this yeah, we will probably talk about this later because mm -hmm. question and interest us a lot. Thank you, Florian. Thank you. So now we have a question from Eric. Eric? Yeah. Yes, we hear you not very well. Oh, okay. Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, hi, Florian. Uh, first, I, I have um, uh, one comment about your ORCID uh, presentation, just to remind you and that we can observe some hybrids between uh, Ophrys ammoni and Ophrys uh, uh, insectifera. Uh, so probably the reproductive isolation you observe in one site is not uh, uh, totally achieved over the distribution area of the sp both species. But my, my question would be, um, uh, is about the second part of your talk about the experiment on Brassica. Uh, looking at the ver phenotypic variation observed across the generation, we have the impression that the response to selection is not constant over time and that uh, only some generation contributes to the final result. Uh, if you see, for instance, for I think it's, it, it, it's about the uh, composition in phenyl, uh, I don't remember one, uh, one of the volatile compounds, mm -hmm. but uh, you have a huge change between generation nine and generation 11. Mm -hmm. And not no 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 change no no phenotypic variation before generation nine. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and and so what about this uh, non-constant response to selection in your experiment? Or, or, or can you uh, explain that? And mm -hmm. you have also the same for plant eight and and and, and other things. Yeah, yeah. Well. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, but I mean, this, this, these kind of ups and downs um, are a typical situation for experimental evolution, where you have some noise and very rarely you have a very clear linear response in the same direction over all the generations. And uh, I mean, some explanations are that, of course, the, the, the composition of the, the experimental populations changes. So you have different patterns of variability each generation. Um, you have also changing patterns of selection um, because the bumblebees are not doing exactly the same thing. And chance is also playing a, a role, of course. Um, so these factors um, explain these differences that you may have. And that's also the reason why you have to really do experimental evolution over several generations to, to, do, to see this trend. Uh, if, you, if you do very few generations, you may not see a, a trend in, at, at the end. 
Thanks a lot. Uh, so we have a question from Yanis now. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I was um, intrigued by the relationship that you showed between abiotic factors and pollination in the introduction. I think uh, if I remember well, you showed that um, the pollinators change with uh, soil type. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering why such relationships uh, should arise. Is it some sort of contingency or uh, is there some uh, profound reason to expect such correlations? Mm -hmm. And perhaps uh, more interesting than discussing the example uh, in the introduction would be to consider whether any abiotic factor could have affected your, your experimental evolution results. Mm -hmm. And if yes, which factor you think that would be, how it would have affected the results and why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the idea for this link between biotic and abiotic factors is that um, um, there could be one primary factor of driving divergence, for example, plants adapting to different soil type. And we know this is very important for plants to adapt to their soil type. Often plants are very specific, growing on only one type of soil. And then, of course, um, it is of interest for, for reinforcement or character displacement that the differences or the, the gene flow between the differently adapted uh, forms is reduced. And an obvious opportunity for plants is to not share pollinators. And this can be done by evolving different floral traits that lead to, to separation of the, of the pollinator guild or adaptation to specific pollinators. And then secondarily, as a, as a, as a means of character displacement, you would have the evolution of different flower types. And the same could be true for, um, for adaptation to different pollinators as the primary uh, drive of, of speciation. First, plants adapt to different pollinators, and then as a mean of um, character displacement or reinforcement, however you want to call it, they adapt to different soil types to sort of um, reduce the, the interference uh, between the differently adapted forms. And in our experiments, um, yeah, I mean, of course, we try to keep the, um, the abiotic factors um, the same. So for sure, there was no climatic difference. And for sure, there was no soil difference in our experiment because the same soil. Um, and, and, but of course, through, through the year, there, there is a difference. Uh, for example, the sun is very different in summer. Then in, in winter in Switzerland, we have not much sun. We have artificial light, of course, but the, the sun uh, is still uh, an important factor. And this may also contribute to the, to the question that, that Eric was uh, posing about the, the, the variation in the response to selection. Um, so the, there is some change throughout the year, essentially, but, but not, there's no, should be no difference between the treatment groups. Yeah, this is important, uh, this experiment. We are actually now we, we addressing the, the importance of abiotic factors. We do experimental evolution with different soil types. So we use natural soils and let the plants adapt in different soils. And we're also starting experiments with, um, with increased temperature, sort of facing the, the, the aspect of climate global warming, essentially, and how it may um, change evolution, interference with pollination, and so on. So this is something that I think is very interesting. Thank you. Thank Thanks a lot. So uh, perhaps I can ask a question uh, now. So I was just wondering uh, regarding your results of differential uh, size evolution uh, between the bumblebee and overfly uh, treatments, uh, whether you have any data uh, that could um, help uh, know if it may be due to a preference of pollinators for plants of different sizes, mm -hmm. or if it's, it may be the consequences of genetic correlation with uh, other preferred traits such as uh, vox or something else and also whether um, regarding those traits whether you compared um, uh, the evolved traits with the traits that were um, uh, present in the uh, original uh, initial uh, population so that's that is to say whether you included those seeds in uh, common gardens after experimental evolution um, yeah, I think um, several factors contribute to that. 
Um, first of all, there's stronger selection for, for tall plants in bumblebees. This, we showed this that it was significantly stronger in bumblebees than in hoverflies. Then um, genetic correlations could also play a role. We know that um, height is genetically correlated to rock production. We've shown this in, in, in artificial selection experiments. So this is also a factor that contributes, yeah. And then uh, also inbreeding. So hoverfly plants have more inbreeding because they do more selfing. And inbreeding has an effect on, uh, on, on, on size of plants, so. But you said you removed uh that right by crossing yeah, the plants that was actually explaining that the downward trend during the experiment but then we crossed the replicates and then we got rid of the inbreeding and yeah but so at the end it should not have played a role i agree yeah mm. so it's the, the other factors that that were important here and then uh, the common garden aspect i mean yes we have we essentially we always have common garden because we use the same, we grow the plants in the same greenhouse, in the same soil, um, this is standardized soil. So we, we basically only do common garden situation. Um, so yes, there was the common garden comparison at the end. So. And where the plants uh, from the, or the seeds that uh, allowed the, you to establish the experimental population mm -hmm. included in? Uh, the first generation seed, yes. They were, we grow, at the end, we, we grow them all together. Ah, oh, that's what you mean. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. That's important because the we, we need to measure the traits at the same uh, time period. Yeah, so we, we grow first generation together with the last generation and then did the phenotyping all together. Okay, thanks a lot. We can discuss that further. So with that, we'll uh, finish with one last question from Candice. Uh, please, Candice. And we end there. Yeah. So um, in the first experiment, uh, why the traits modified by the pollination of hoverflies is the plant height? Why not another trait? Uh, do you have any ideas? Uh, sorry, you must, can you repeat? <laughs> it's um, uh, why do you have an, an ideas uh, of um, why the, 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 the traits modified by the pollination of hoverflies mm -hmm. is plant height? Why, why, uh, why not another trait, for example? Uh, why height? So the, I mean, the height did not actually change much um, for hoverflies. It was um, basically the same as in the beginning. So there was not much evolution in height for the, for the, for the hoverfly plants. I mean, there, there was change. The bumblebees? Sorry? So it was the bumblebees that the height increased? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So why? <laughs> why? Uh, that's uh, a okay. Bumblebees like taller plants. First of all, they can they're easier to see. They because yeah. they stand out of the population, and then they also have more flowers. And of course, with more flowers, they there's more reward available for the bumblebees. So that's the reason why they like the taller plants. And, and this is very commonly also found in studies of selection in nature that um, there is strong selection, pollinator intermediate selection for taller plants uh, is a very common um, finding in nature. So that's, it's not something unusual here. Okay, okay thank you. Good. Good. Okay, thanks a lot. So I think we can... Um... Now, um, thanks very much, Florian, for giving this very interesting talk and very clear. So as I said in the beginning, uh, if anyone is interesting uh, for discussing this uh, further, we are meeting in roughly an hour. So just send me an email uh, for the inv uh, Zoom invitation. Thanks a lot. Thanks the SEM organizers also for um, their help and um, have a nice lunch to everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.